Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Project Reshare Forum. Uh, my name is Peter Murray, and, and I am the open source community advocate at Index Data and the host for today's event. Uh, our topic today is Project Reshare. Uh, today's session, like all forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Foundation's YouTube channel. Uh, as an open forum, participants can see each other's names uh, and all questions submitted. And we've muted everyone except for the panelists to ensure good sound quality. Uh, we do value your participation and encourage you to engage in this topic. Uh, use the Q&A box within Zoom at the bottom to enter questions and comments as they come to you. Uh, I will offer those to the speakers uh, at the end of the presentation. Our panelists today are Jill Morris, Executive Director of Palsy, Kurt Munson, uh, the Acting Head of Access Services at Northwestern University, and Kristen Wilson, Project Manager and Business Analyst at Index Data. Uh, Kurt, I think we're starting with you. Take it away, please. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, the first thing is I got to take the interim off my uh, title, so I'm actually just the head of Access Services. Ah, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. So welcome everyone um, to this introduction to Project Reshare. Project Reshare is reimagining resource sharing. Uh, it's a collaborative project amongst a wide group of people. And what I think makes ReShare unique is that it's not just libraries, because frankly, libraries have been collaborating with each other for years and years and years to do resource sharing. I mean, that's fundamentally what it is. What's different with ReShare is it's a collaborative between libraries, consortia that libraries belong to, and different companies who create software in support of libraries. Our goal is to be innovative, to come up with new and different ways of handling these things by listening to everyone's voice, whether that's somebody that says, okay, we can do this in Java, or somebody that says, no, we actually use a different shipper. We want to be very creative in our approach to this in how we make a system that will work for everyone, not just library staff, but also our users. We're taking a very creative approach with this by involving everyone and all of their different points of knowledge, whether that's somebody like myself with 20 plus years of resource sharing experience, somebody that's on you know, the lines day to day doing that sort of work, or somebody who you know, is very skilled at writing software. Our goal is to be resourceful and to use the resources that are available to us so that we can create a product that will work for everyone, a product that will grow, a product that will mature and do things differently than the way things have been done in the past with how these types of programs have been developed. In part, ReShare grows out of the Big Ten Academic Alliance's various uh, reports that I was part of writing or you know, the lead on some of them for our vision for next generation resource delivery. I know the resource delivery phrase is mine. Um, there was nothing absolutely groundbreaking in this. There's nothing particularly unique about you know, being out here in the cornfields of the Midwest. Rather, I think what we did was we put into words what many other places and groups were thinking. These can be boiled down to two things, two sentences out of that 17 page report. The first thing is the discovery to delivery process is fragmented with too many services and options presented to our patrons. Stated differently, or my analogy for this, is it's like we have all these different library systems, and if we think of them as icebergs, there's this giant part that's the library process under the water, and then we have a teeny tiny tip that we present to the patron. And then they have to jump across all of these different icebergs to get from point A to point B to get their stuff done. It's just not a very rational, understandable, easy, to you know, start working with system that we present them with. That's in part because the access and delivery options are not communicated in terms 
of what the patron wants or what the patron needs. Rather, they derive from what the back office library system does. Stated differently, our landscape of resource sharing at this point is one of change and also recognition of how things are different than they were years ago. First off, we're prioritizing library space for patrons, and that means reducing shelf space for books. And I'm going to argue that that's a good thing because we wouldn't have universities if we and we wouldn't have libraries if we didn't have patrons it would be a warehouse and at least on my campus storing books that nobody's using in the middle of campus on very expensive real estate doesn't make sense those can go live at a remote storage location in fact in many ways all of your libraries are for my patrons remote storage locations the question is how do we deliver those materials Part of the reason that your remote storage locations is because everybody has a tight material budget. We can't buy as many copies or even a copy as we would previously. Secondly, this means that we rely upon the collective collection, not only for things that we didn't buy or that we don't have the money for now, but also for those things that we somehow failed to purchase 50, 100 years ago. One of Northwestern's failures is we did not buy Indonesian materials in the 1960s, and therefore we don't own them to support all of these graduate students from Indonesia that have shown up in the last couple of years here. You know, we need that collective collection to build on our individual strengths. The problem is these things run through legacy systems that are fractured and the workflows that those legacy systems impose upon us and those legacy systems are having trouble keeping up with what we're doing right now the entire notion of them being able to handle shared print initiatives and print retention initiatives is I think somewhat questionable and this is particularly concerning for those of us in access services as we see increased reliance on the sharing of print and those returnable items these create challenges for our users, and I don't think these are challenges that our users should be, frankly, having to face. You know, as I mentioned, that fractured discovery to delivery process, those icebergs, those are based upon the library systems rather than what it is that the user needs and wants to do. And it seems to me that really we should be putting our customers first in this situation, not library rules or functionality that existing library systems have. Our availability information to them is opaque, difficult to understand whether something can be loaned, how soon it's going to show up, whether that's from a branch or from a library that's you know, halfway across the country, what the loan period is going to be. We're very poor at you know, communicating those things. Depending on which system it is that they're using, they have to sign into the account for that system, but that system doesn't talk to other systems, even though the rest of the university is running on a single sign-in system. Um, and I think many of these things are because the systems are based on managing item by item requesting and routing and tracking of things, not of serving what people want. Our communications are poor in existing systems, you place a request, you have radio silence, and then, you know, it shows up and we send you an email, and then we have these inconsistent and arbitrary policies that are all based upon individual libraries and what they want to do, not what it is that the user needs to do. And just as we're challenging our users, we're also challenging our staff with existing systems. Those fractured systems that cause problems for patrons cause problems for the staff too. We have system imposed legacy workflows that you know were designed for an era 20 years ago. And you know, these impose costs on the staff. Many of us participate in consortial borrowing systems because they provide you know, lower costs than traditional interlibrary loan, but trying to jump across those consortia does not give us the same level of cost effectiveness or efficiency of sharing, or can we even get the same standards applied for loan periods and whatnot, because these tend to be consortia 
the systems, the software is designed to make every single consortia a silo or a walled garden and moving across those is difficult in part because of a lack of interoperability and because when we do have standards like NSIP or ISO or whatever, we end up with multiple flavors of them, each one developed somewhat differently by a vendor, so we tr don't truly have the ability to talk across things. Mar we're seeing market consolidation. There's less competition with systems being purchased or simply going offline and no longer being available. We have fewer and fewer truly vendor neutral solutions because of that lack of competition. And we're seeing a decline in lack of agency because there are fewer places to go to to say, hey, we need the system to do this. That equals lack of choice. And most disturbingly, we're seeing a lack of development of systems that do what it is that we need to do. So in the end, ultimately, all of this boils down to a need for a modern user driven and that user is not just the patron, that user is also the staff. We need that approach rather than the system silos of software systems. If we put this as a picture, we have walls everywhere. You know, it's very difficult to do this and it simply doesn't need to be that difficult. We have new and different ways of handling things. And at that, I'm gonna switch over to the next slide. And I'm also going to stop sharing my screen and turn this over to Jill to pick it up from here. Okay, great, let me see if I can choose the right window. Just one moment. Too many things open. Okay, can you see my screen? I can. All right, good. So hi everyone. Um, my name is Jill Morris. I'm the executive director at Palsy and uh, currently the chair of the steering committee for Project Reshare. So I'm really excited to talk with you about uh, this project today and to build off of uh, sort of the context that Kurt has set for us. Um, so Project Reshare began as a set of uh, grassroots conversations within the context that Kurt just described, um, in which consortial staff and advocates for resource sharing began discussing the challenges and sort of what we hoped for the future for these strategic services within our communities. Um, I know within my consortium, resource sharing is really uh, critical for our success, and it's, it's really a reason that people join the consortium in the first place. Um, so it was within this context that, that ReShare was created and sort of envisioned as a possible solution uh, to many of the issues that, that Kurt just outlined for us really well. So what is ReShare? Um, first and foremost, ReShare uh, really is a community and it's, it's got a long-term vision of how consortia and libraries and vendors and software developers and others can work together to achieve sort of a user-centered provision of these sorts of services uh, with resource sharing. So I think the project is unique in that it sees all the players coming to the table as equals, uh, which certainly within resource sharing uh, usually doesn't happen in terms of the conversations that happen between uh, providers of services and libraries and, and, and hopefully users as well. Um, so we want to come together as equals um, in order to ensure the long-term health of the resulting software and the community that, that we're producing here. Um, I think uh, the community mind mindedness of, of this group is, is really important in terms of being able to achieve our goals. And it's a really powerful way for us to engage um, and make change and, and hopefully improve the services that, that we're offering. Um, I, I think that in large part, um, this is really important in open source uh, projects because we do need to find that sustainable path forward and really engage the community in, in being able to, uh, to uh, create a software that's meaningful, that's relevant, responsive to the needs of, of all of those of us that are using it. Um, so uh, part of that is also sort of engaging in really transparent discussions. And today uh, is, a, is a good introduction to sort of what we've been up to. Um, but there's a real uh, desire for transparency here and, and sharing with the community what we've been doing, you know, all of the details uh, to the extent that people want to know them uh, are, are available to folks, um, including the costs, our challenges, uh, sort of the priorities that we're, we're trying to, to develop. And, 
Um, and I think there's a certain element of trust that that transparency brings. Um, and uh, that's been something that I've really enjoyed personally about being involved uh, in this project. And I think it's a large, in, in large part, sort of what brought this community together was that desire for, for trust. Um, another important aspect of this project is sort of the openness with which we're creating the software and the ownership model that we're using, um, which I'll go into a little bit more specifically in, in a few moments. But um, the intellectual property will be held in common. So, so the, the software that's produced will be held by the Open Library Foundation um, under open source uh, software licenses that are, are permissive and allow anybody to take this and innovate on it. Uh, the Open Library Foundation is a 501c3 that's been set up specifically with the purpose of shepherding collaborations for libraries. And I think that's really important to know. I mean, I think many of you probably are aware of OLF as the home for the Folio project, but it's also home to other projects too. And I think libraries have a real opportunity here to actually use the infrastructure that's in place and not just to use it, but actually to help lead uh, the Open Library Foundation and help it realize sort of its full potential. Um, because it's already set up, it's there, it's something that, that we can utilize to help establish collaborations across the boundaries with when, within which we normally work. Um, and I think as a consortium leader, um, to me, that's really exciting. I think that's not been something that we've had a lot of access to in the past. And um, so I would just encourage uh, those of you listening to, to consider that opportunity and to think about ways that, that perhaps you could get involved in, in thinking about this. Um, so OLF, uh, the, the ReShare project is a member, uh, has been accepted for, for membership within the Open Library Foundation, and OLF provides uh, many of the collaborative infrastructures that we need, including, uh, you know, just sort of the basics of, of technical collaboration, uh, Slack channels, uh, Zoom, uh, meeting space, a website, that sort of thing. Um, and so it's been really useful um, in, in that respect, but it's also sort of gonna be the home for that intellectual property and a neutral space where we can, um, where we can certainly uh, build this project and think about ways to, to move it forward. Um, and I should mention too, I, I, I am a part of other open source projects that are considering membership in, in the Open Library Foundation. And I think that, um, that again, you know, the, the ability to talk with other uh, folks working on other similar related projects is really powerful because we can leverage the work that's being done in other spaces. And that's certainly um, something that, that the reshare community intends to do. Although we are a, a completely independent project, we are not um, a part of, of the Folio project in any kind of formal way, we do have these informal relationships and ability to share, um, which gives reshare really a head start in its technical development. And Kristen will talk about that in just a few, few moments. Um, so lastly, ReShare is uh, an open source software and it's made up of three main components. Kristen's going to delve into this uh, more deeply in just a few moments and actually share with you some of our exciting prototypes. Um, but at its core, what we're producing here is a system uh, that is modular, um, community owned and managed, of course, and hopefully highly scalable so that um, cons consortia with different configurations are able to use this and then collaborate across consortia, as Kurt was mentioning. Um, so the first component is discovery, which um, in a nutshell is, is really about a shared uh, set of aggregated holdings um, or shared index so that we know what we all have access to. So that's one uh, major component. A second component is request management, being able to route those requests appropriately um, and in a user-centered way, which I think is, um, you know, one of what Kurt introduced, how Kurt introduced ReShare in the beginning was resource sharing reimagined. That's so right. I think that what we're doing is thinking about what's the right way to, to manage requests, not based on sort of the technical limitations that we've been um, under in the past, but what's the right way for our users? How do we get the material to where we need it to go um, in a way that really uh, benefits our users at the end of the day? And then thirdly, um, 
it's a fulfillment technology and, um, and an unmediated one. So one that allows us to do our jobs uh, as efficiently, as effectively as possible. Uh, the unmediated component of what we're producing here, I think is really important. Um, and we've engaged a community to help us with finding new efficiencies that haven't been a part of our systems to date. So uh, we are re-envisioning resource sharing very much so. We're reimagining how it can be built from really from the ground up um, with the input of, of some really important uh, members within our community. So uh, the vision for the project really does, you know, as we've been saying, put the user in the center of this equation. And um, you can see from the image uh, in, in the screen here, this was a, a, a photograph that was taken from uh, from our first meeting in Philadelphia, where we kind of decided, yeah, we're going to do this thing. Um, and that's Nora Detloff from University of Houston, um, you know, sticking post-it notes up on, on the board. But coming together around a shared vision was actually really um, sort of surprisingly easy, I think, um, as we started to talk about what we wanted uh, for this strategic set of services and the software that was going to support uh, those efforts. We all agreed that we really needed to change the model and introduce a new option into the, to the marketplace. We needed to have influence um, in ways that we have not had before. And we certainly needed to focus on our users. Um, we uh, set out some goals for ourselves and a vision that uh, this software and this platform and this community would enable innovation um, and that, that would be a really important part of sort of the structure that we needed to build for ourselves. So, um, you know, that, that's a huge part of why open source software licensing is so important. Open source has its own sets of challenges, as many of you are aware, but it also offers so much opportunity that with sort of the right governance models in place and the right uh, people around the table, we think that um, the, the, the reward far outweighs the risks um, in, in this setting. We also wanted to produce a, a, an ILL system and set of technologies that were scalable. Um, Today's options are, are quite limited, I think, in many cases. You either have to all share the same system, uh, same ILS, or um, uh, they're, they're quite limited within your own consortium, uh, generally. Most of our options only allow us to share within specifically specific sets of designated groups. And I think what we're hoping for here is to allow for greater, a greater degree of collaboration across consortia, across groups, across libraries, especially knowing that so many of our libraries have multiple consortial citizenships. I know within my own group, I have members of the Big Ten, I have members of Willa, I have members of Ivy Plus libraries, um, and so on. The list goes on. So we really need to be able to scale these in ways that are smart. Um, and, and I think uh, we're hitting on that, uh, certainly with the project for our minimum viable product. Um, that we're working on. We think ownership uh, by the community is just so important. And when I say community, I don't just mean libraries, I mean software developers too. Um, because I think this is, it, it should be a true partnership here where we're, um, where we're all sharing a vision, uh, certainly, and we're coming up with sustainable business models that will support that vision and engage everybody from within the community so that we're all starting from a very different place than where we as libraries are sort of, I think, most accustomed to starting. Um, we're very used to uh, going to a company and saying, I want to purchase this set of services from you. We are not so used to coming to the table as equals with them um, in places where we share vision. And, and I think uh, there's a, a really sort of extraordinary uh, switch that happens when, when you come to the table in, in, in this type of an environment and you're able to uh, work together uh, to achieve your shared goals. Um, it becomes much more about the service and less about, um, you know, is this company providing the, the tool that I need? Because the innovation is possible. And then it's just a matter of talking through how we're going to fund and resource these types of things. Um, and I think it gives libraries a sense of agency in, in that we are able to uh, move forward and, and create something that works for, for our users at the end of the day. Um, and lastly, I think this one's really important too, vendor neutrality. Uh, we really want to be able to work in a space that is sort of agnostic of the technology choices that we've 
uh, that we've had. We, we can't just jump systems every day. Um, it's costly for libraries. And it's really important that we be able to connect to the things we've already invested in. Um, and so finding solutions that are vendor neutral that allow us to connect interoperably with, with lots of different systems you know, even other resource sharing systems, I think is just so important to the long term success to, success of what resource sharing is really all about. Um, so how do how does this work in practice? What's what's the model here for for community ownership? Um, so what we've got is sort of a set of challenges and opportunities within our ecosystem. We think that companies can bring, you know, very specific skills and resources that that libraries don't have. And uh, on the flip side, libraries bring a set of perspectives and um, and a, a user focus that that companies, quite frankly, need to be more aware of. Um, and, and I think the challenges that we find in our traditional sort of purchasing of services from vendors is often because that mutual understanding isn't there. Um, so we think that, you know, ideas are going to arise by um, having people together at the table and how do we how do we bring about a sense of trust uh, within those conversations and I think that's really by us being in the room together hashing through the details um, so we think that we have an opportunity here to change the ecosystem in some ways and to create a more healthy ecosystem where we're able to really focus in on you know our relationships with companies as service providers in providing the best possible service, but that innovation um, uh, that happens needs to be shared and it needs to be something that libraries engage with as well as our, as our commercial providers. Um, so in terms of, of the ownership that happens of the process, we have uh, a set of uh, governance model, uh, uh, we really have a governance model in place that I think is, is working really incredibly well within this project. We have a steering committee and I'll share with you the names of, of the folks that are involved there. We have a product management team that is uh, charged with sort of high level prioritization of uh, product functionality. We have a team of subject matter experts which are engaged in the nitty gritty details of how do we, how do we produce a system that meets today's challenges and, and really sort of uh, breaks down uh, all of the problems so that we can understand uh, where the potential roadblocks are. And then we have our developers and these different um, groups within the project. Um, we just had our first team meeting a, a couple of weeks ago um, where everybody within all of these communities got together and shared the progress on, on, on the project. And it was incredible to see the number of people uh, that are, are so engaged already at this stage of the project um, in building out a, a new community and in building out a, a software platform that we hope um, will work for, for so many libraries across the country and really across, across the world. Um, I've already mentioned this, that uh, the Open Library Foundation is going to own that product at the end of the day. The intellectual property will be uh, released under an Apache 2 uh, license, which um, allows anybody to remix and, and reuse the, the software that, that comes out of this, commercial providers, as well as libraries, which is really exciting to have that flexibility uh, built into it. So at the end of the day, there's a little bit less risk because we, we know that we're, we're engaging in this project and then we at the end are going to be able to take whatever's produced and um, do what we want with it which um, I think is a freedom and sort of a, a, a sense gives us a sense of, of agency over over our tools that that we're using so who's involved um, we have representatives from a diversity of institutions and organizations um, you're going to see names on this list that I think many of you will recognize as leaders in in resource sharing um, we have uh, folks from many different categories and the steering committee is charged with really setting the vision for the project, thinking about how to resource this project, and then, um, you know, sort of settling any, any uh, questions that come up from, from other areas of the project, whether that's the product management team or the subject matter experts, making sure that we're, we're staying in line with the vision. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what the steering committee does. We've been meeting uh, once a week um, since summer, really. Um, uh, at noon every Monday, we, we get together and we talk about um, how to make sure that this project happens. So this is a team of really invested individuals and organizations that have, have uh, committed time of these folks uh, to, uh, to this project and, and believe in it.
Um, we have, as I mentioned, a product management team. You can see the names listed here. Again, making high-level prioritization decisions about which functionalities and features make its way into the roadmap and when. Um, folks that have committed to the project have a, have a seat on the product management team, uh, which is developing that roadmap for us. And then we have a series of subject matter experts. Um, and we intentionally really try to uh, diversify the types of individuals and skill sets that we uh, that we wanted to involve in this project. So it's not just resource sharing people. It's folks who uh, have uh, clear um, expertise in discovery, expertise in metadata, um, expertise in day-to-day -day resource sharing, um, and in addition to all sorts of other engagement with, within their libraries and their consortia. And I think this is a really powerful group that has in, invested a lot of time, again, uh, working with our UX developer and designer to uh, create something that, that will work for the community. Um, this is a, probably needs to be updated again. I think we've got folks from just all over the, the country and all over the world uh, that are at this point participating in the project. And, um, and we'd love to add more dots to this map, I think. If, you, if you're interested in being engaged, um, Kristen's going to mention a few things at the end about sort of what you can do. Um, but, but we're excited by this, and, and we've had interest from Canada and, and other places that, uh, that are not yet on the map that we're, we're really uh, excited about. So our timeline really quickly, um, we're in the phase of uh, developing mock-ups and prototypes, and, and Kristen's going to show you some of those things really shortly here, um, with the goal of producing an, a minimum viable product by the end of fall. Um, we clearly hope that we're going to be able to do some software testing and piloting uh, next spring. So that's not that far away. We're, we're really moving at a fast pace here. And all along the way, we're going to be doing community development. Um, uh, I think we've, we've got a really strong foundation of trust and a great group uh, that we're working with. But um, we're going to be looking at business models and thinking about preferred service providers and, and partnerships here. Uh, just a quick note about sort of how this is all being funded, and then I'm going to turn it over to Kristen. Um, so a couple of consortia have made clear commitments to the project um, in terms of monetary uh, contributions and, and other and in other ways. Um, Index Data is our commercial um, is our primary commercial partner that's invested heavily in this project so far. Um, they uh, have invested at, at roughly a two to one rate over what uh, consortia consortia and library partners have invested so far. Um, and uh, you can see sort of a screen grab I did of, of where our budget is today. And, and, and we do want to be very transparent about sort of where we are in terms of costs and what it means to, to produce this project at the end of the day. Um, my consortium has made a monetary commitment as well. Um, and uh, we really were wanting to invest in kickstarting this project by offering up some uh, development dollars for UX design um, and, and development. So, uh, so the Palsy Consortium has contributed in that way monetarily. The Triangle Research Libraries Network, TRLN, um, has also contributed uh, on behalf of their four institutions um, to help us become members in the Open Library Foundation. And so they've made a, a, a commitment and, and, um, and endorsed you know, their commitment to the project um, as well. We are um, actively seeking grant funds. Uh, we have a proposal uh, out to IMLS now. We, we are looking at other ways of funding this project too, and we're certainly looking at other partnerships. Um, I think something that's really important to note, and then I'm, I'm gonna, gonna stop and, and pass it over to uh, Kristen, but I think something that's important to note is that um, one of the ways that, that we're, we're funding this and, and one of the reasons that Index Data has been able to contribute and be involved here is because we have set up some provisional service arrangements, meaning that um, Index Data uh, was uh, requested to become a preferred service provider um, by the steering committee members, knowing that um, you know, if, if we're successful here and, and 
you know, all evidence points to, yes, we will be. We want to have a commercial service provider on the other end, ready to go day one, who can offer these sets of services to our libraries. Um, and what that does is, is sort of benefit libraries, certainly by giving us confidence that there will be a service provider on the other end who is ready and willing to support these services. And on the index data side, where they're um, uh, investing in an open source project that any other provider could pick up and, and take, they've got some confidence that they will have um, business on on that you know within the first couple of years to help recoup some of those investments that they've made in the community and so I think what we've done here is we've we've formed some partnerships that have um, really helped us to move forward with confidence and um, establish that trust that that we've been talking about all along okay so I'm gonna um, advance my slide and then I'm going to stop sharing and, and I'm going to turn it over to Kristen to uh, delve into what it looks like at this point, what the, what the product is, is looking like and, and she'll share more information about the development of ReShare. And while Kristen is getting her screen share set up, uh, I do want to remind you to uh, use the question and answer box uh, to start uh, putting in some questions that uh, uh, Jill and Kurt and Kristen uh, can answer at the end of the presentation. Uh, and with that, I see you're sharing, uh, Kristen, uh, although you need to unmute yourself uh, and take it away. There you go. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, so I'm Kristen Wilson from Index Data, and my role in this project is as uh, the project coordinator and product owner. So I'm kind of the one who's working between all the teams to make sure that uh, we all know what each group is doing and that things are kind of moving forward in harmony. So I'm going to be talking a little bit um, in more detail about the real functionality of ReShare um, and what we've done so far. A lot of what I'll be showing will be prototypes. So just sort of keep it in mind that these are early, they're prototypes, they're not real functionality yet, but I think they do a really great job of showing our vision and the way it's coming to life and the goals that we're working towards. Um, so before I get into the prototypes, though, I did want to talk a little bit about Folio as a starting point, since this is uh, I'm affiliated with Folio, and I imagine we have some Folio community members here. Um, and Jill mentioned that we are taking advantage of some of the Folio infrastructure that is already been built. Um, and this has been great for us in ReShare because um, it both gives us a head start in terms of development and it really supports the way that we want to work and that we want to build ReShare. So the things that we're using from Folio, um, we're going to be using Ocopy and the system layer, which are kind of the backend internal components that just let us sort of build software and support messaging between different parts of the application. Um, and we're also using the Folio UI toolkit, which is called Stripes, which kind of gives a, a starting point of different templates for the way that screens will look and gives it a consistent look and feel. And within that infrastructure, we have the ability to build individual applications um, that use kind of a microservices approach. So each one is contained. They'll be able to be used together, but they could also be reused separately. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, and so I think um, in addition to just being a great starting point, this is also a great um, example of community-owned software at work and the vision that Folio has started and the way that we see this growing. Um, you know, so Folio, rather than just saying, we're just gonna build Folio, they said, we're gonna build a suite of tools that we then build the Folio LSP on top of, but those tools are just out there for anyone else to use. And so this is the first real test of somebody coming along to use them. And I think that's really exciting. And I think that's really kind of the vision that the Open Library Foundation is supporting. And I hope it's the start of more and more people starting to use these components. Um, so the other thing we're doing, and this is also borrowed from Folio, is a UX first approach. And the idea here is to engage with our subject matter experts and our product management team to really understand what do we want this system to do to define the purpose um, and to develop a set of concepts and prototypes and guidelines that will then kind of guide the development of the system. 
Um, and this is being led by Philip Jacobson from a company called Sam Hang. Um, they're based in Copenhagen and have also been the lead UX developers for Folio. Um, and so anybody who is involved in Folio will immediately recognize this slide because Philip has this very distinctive style of making these sketches that are a really great way to help us understand things visually. And this was one was kind of a starting point where we actually tried to map out um, the entire flow of a resource sharing transaction across people and systems and institutions with all kinds of annotations. So that's usually how these things go is, you know, we start out with like, here's what we think. And then it turns out that there's a, actually a ton of feedback and, and things that we then can react to and adapt to. Um, so then what I'm going to do next is kind of step through a series of prototypes that we have uh, in progress. And this will both show what we've done, but also kind of give a sense of the overall functionality of reshare and what we expect the system to do, uh, primarily for the minimum viable product. But um, we'll touch also a little bit on some of the things that we might see as more of a long term vision. Um, and some of these I'll just share a screenshot and then some I'm going to actually try to pop into the real prototypes. Um, so the first one I'll share, and this actually is not one of Philip's prototypes. This is a prototype uh, for the shared index that was created by Nils Eric Nilsson from uh, Index Data, who's part of our development team. And um, this is basically shows uh, the way that we're using the folio inventory module as a starting point for the reshare shared index. Um, so what the way that we envision this working is that each library who's part of a consortium that's using reshare will be able to contribute their um, their catalog information, so uh, bibliographic records, holdings, and items, potentially availability status too, um, and that will all be kind of sent into a pipeline where it is matched and deduped with the idea that we end up with a master record for each bibliographic record with then the holdings from each library attached. And so um, for those who aren't familiar with Folio, Folio's inventory module is actually um, sort of a way of viewing a library's catalog within Folio that makes it, uh, that is, it's designed to be able to show multiple sources of data in a single UI. And that was originally envisioned with the idea that, you know, one library might have its MARC catalog, but maybe an IR or an e-resources knowledge base and want to pull multiple records into a single uh, point of access or and searching. So we're kind of repurposed that a little bit to actually pull in records from across libraries. So you can see here, um, this is sort of the main point of this slide is just this holdings area where what we're hoping is that we can actually see each library that has a copy of this information about if it's available and, and what it is and then the ability to sort of go and see more information about that. Um, this, this shared index then becomes a data source that can be used for discovery. And we're hoping to support two primary use cases. One will be the idea that a library can use APIs to take the metadata from the shared index and actually show it as part of a local discovery tool. The other one will be um, a dedicated consortium of reshare that could be used by some or all members of a consortium and that's um, specifically to support people who either don't have the ability to show things in their local catalog or maybe just don't have the ability to implement it in the short term that'll be there for them. Um, so that's kind of uh, covers the discovery piece in terms of what we've worked on so far. So we still have a lot of work to do here in terms of our match rules and how we're actually going to deduplicate records and behavior and how people are going to get records in. So there's a lot of open questions, but I think um, we've done a lot of good uh, thinking about kind of the initial model. Uh, so the next one is the discovery or the directory app. And for this, I'm actually going to go here into the prototype to show this. So this is one of Philip's prototypes. And these are nice because they, they look really nice and they have some basic functionality where 
you can kind of click around. Some things work, some things don't. Uh, but it gives you a little sense of how it might look and feel. And so uh, the directory is kind of the backbone of ReShare's fulfillment uh, services. So this is where people define all the rules about resource sharing, how it works, who they're, they're sharing with, that type of thing. Um, and so this example just shows some of the things that we think might be in this directory. Uh, one of the things that has been actually great feedback from our subject matter experts is that some of this may actually need to be set at the consortial level and not the individual library level. So we're still sorting out what falls into each bucket. But some of the things that might be either be defined here or just shown here are for any given library um, codes, so we have OCLC here, but we, we do want people to be able to include codes from different things, so maybe um, RAPID or other systems, maybe a dedicated reshare code if we end up needing that. Um, information about what consortia a library is part of, basic things like addresses and info, billing, um, a lot of this is not really fleshed out yet, um, but um, different contact people. Some of the things that I did want to show is this loan rules and policies. And this is something that may end up at the consortial level, but actually being able to define things like for different types of materials, how can we loan it? Um, it may be that there's different policies for different consortiums. So those are the types of questions that we're working through. So this is really kind of an, an admin type view, but it's necessary for all the other functionality to happen. Um, one of the other things I should mention that's not shown here is we're working on things like um, load balancing algorithms and that type of thing too, so we can support that unmediating borrowing where we actually need to select a lender. Oh, let me just make sure this is the next one I want to show. Oh, actually, before I move on to that, um, I will just show that this is actually kind of our first uh, real software um, of a directory screen. And so you can see from the prototype to this, it's actually pretty good, um, I think, for our, our first go. And it, it shows the Stripes toolkit in use. Um, of course, this is just code here and that, that'll have to be flushed out. But we are, this is kind of the first app that we've started to really make progress on. All right, so the next one is going to be requests. And so this is where we really start to get into the meat of the fulfillment app, where we have an app where we can actually see all the requests that have been in, been placed and look at any of those requests and find out the details about it. So if I click on here, um, this brings up the, the full record view of this request. And what's in here right now is actually kind of a selection of the, the types of things that we would like to support. Every request won't show all of these because it will really depend on what state the request is in. Um, but some of the things that we've, we've been working on, um, this one shows that if somebody placed a request for something but it couldn't be matched against the shared index, um, being able to just do a search into that shared index and try to find it yourself and, and complete the request. Um, this one is if the request had been placed and it's matched something in the shared index, but it's just not available yet. So we could see that, you know, we're looking for things to fall apart, but we have not found a supplier yet. Um, this is probably the, the most common where uh, we will have this unmediated borrowing approach. So this will show you, okay, the system has found the item, it's looked at all those directory settings and, and decided these are the best lenders for you. Um, and maybe some status like if this, in this case, if the, they found that this was missing, they couldn't fill it, they rejected that request. And so then it moved on to number two and we've got some status info there too. Um, we've got information about the user. So you could um, probably link out to something with more details here, maybe depending on your permissions. Shipping, I'll talk about, uh, we have a separate prototype for that, but we definitely want to be able to pull in shipping information and show that here um, and maybe rely on some of these shipping APIs to actually show like some nice details about like where it is in the process. Um, this, this one covers, and Jill mentioned this a little bit, uh, fulfillment that we would like 
reshare to be able to kind of pass requests out to other services. So say this failed within the consortium, there was no one who could lend it. It'd be great to be able to send it out to like Rapid R or Iliad in a seamless way. Um, so that's something we'll be looking at. And then we've also got patron communication where this is just a, a record of the notices that have been sent. Um, but what I like about this is that I think it, it just kind of shows the way that we really want to surface information in a way that looks very modern, very readable and user friendly and kind of gives you the information that you need in the place where you are. Um, so this next slide, um, this is kind of more of a long term vision. So this is something that I will say is uh, not going to be part of MVP, but we have been trying to throughout the project, think about the future and where we would like to go long term. And one of the things that's really come up is the idea that we might have a more workflow centric view of resource sharing in the future. And this kind of uses, um, there's within Folio, we've done a lot of uh, prototyping for a to-do app and a workflow app. And so this is kind of contingent on those actually getting built for Folio. But the idea would be that rather than just looking at a request, you would actually be able to look at kind of a more scoped version of requests that are assigned to you uh, with different statuses to be able to see for each of those its workflow where it's been what's been done what's coming up for it and then in here you see kind of a lot of the same things that you saw on that request screen but with potentially some actions along the bottom and that would be based on the state that this request is in these are the things you might do next so i think this is a really great ambitious vision um, i think we're a little uncertain about when we'll get there but i think it's really nice that we've been putting the effort into both think about the short term and the long term. Let's see. I'm going to pop over to the shipping app. Um, and so shipping is uh, at the moment we're envisioning it as a separate app within reshare, although you know that I think there are some questions about that too and how tightly it needs to be integrated with requests. Um, but what we have right now is the idea that for each shipment, you would actually have a shipment record where you could come in and see information about that shipment. So things like tracking numbers, potentially pulling in these tracking statuses from the shipper. And one thing to mention about this too, I think, you know, we've talked about what does the patron know about a request that they've placed. And I think this, um, since everything in reshare will be made available via APIs, this could give us the ability to actually surface this to the patron too, if that was something a library wanted to do. So there's a bit of a, an idea that we could give this more Amazon-like experience where people actually are used to now getting the tracking number for something that they're waiting to arrive. Um, we've got information about the shippers, and then this is if you had a shipment with multiple requests in the same box, you could actually see everything and link out to all these different requests. And then we've got more information about the tracking history. And then um, I've got one more to show. Um, this one, let's start here. This one is kind of a, 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 a Appendix, that's not the right word, but it's related to shipping. Um, this app is called Unbox. And the idea is to create some of these smaller apps that just kind of let people do one task in volume. So the idea here is that if you have received a shipment, you could actually just scan the shipping label um, and then go in here and see everything that's supposed to be in that shipment and then scan the barcodes of all those things. So scan a barcode and you're basically saying yes this was in here um, if something was not in there you could mark that it didn't arrive in the shipment um, so it's basically kind of verifying and letting people if you've got like student workers who are just unboxing kind of fly through all this and then move on to their next steps um, 
Um, so that's, uh, that's a lot of the prototypes that we've done so far. Uh, they're actually coming out so fast and furious that we have new ones that I have not even prepared to talk about today. So I think that that's been really great uh, to see all that, that coming out and the excitement of people being able to imagine how they would like this to work. Um, we still have a, a lot of work to do to turn these into reality. So we're gonna be working really closely with our development team to kind of reconcile these visions against the technology and what's possible and to tweak them to, to come in line with what we think we'll really build. Uh, we'll be writing user stories that then we'll use kind of an agile development process to start slating this into sprints and actually get into the work. So we're really hopeful that we can be ready to um, do that within the next month or so. Um, I think it's really is moving forward pretty quickly. But I do think this is also just a really great um, kind of example of what the subject matter experts have brought to this project, this, the ability to, to know like this is how we would really want this to work. Um, I'll mention a little bit about Beyond MVP. So the steering committee has been spending some time thinking about the long term of reshare and where we might eventually go. Um, and these are just a few of the things that have risen to the top. So cross flat cross-platform support. Um, this is kind of getting into that idea that Jill mentioned of being able to work across different systems and different groups. Um, and we saw a little bit of that with like that rapid tracking number in the prototype. Uh, but just we really want this to be something where it's like if it doesn't work in the consortium, you could send it out to Iliad in a very seamless way without the patron having to like, you know, know that this is the reshare form, this is the Iliad form and that type of thing. Electronic delivery is definitely on our radar. Um, I don't think we said this explicitly, but for MVP, um, the scope for reshare is returnable. So we're really focusing only on physical items, but we know that if people are using reshare, eventually they're gonna want it to do um, both print and electronic items. And so that'll be something that uh, we'll try to prioritize once we get beyond MVP. Local workflow support is another, uh, another element that I think would be really valuable. And this is the idea that reshare could kind of become like a hub of operations for resource sharing. So not just managing consortial requests, but you know, pulling in requests of all kinds, sorting into queues, um, sorting into staff queues, being a place where people could really come to do their work. And then of course, the integration with other services and platforms would be key in terms of making that really work. Um, and then finally, we have talked a bit about uh, supporting shared print across libraries. So if you had you know, a shared print repository that multiple libraries contribute to and also shared collection analysis, if a consortium wants to make decisions together about what print materials to keep or weed. Um, I think that the shared index component really lends itself to some of that, the ability to see what everyone has and do these comparisons. Um, and then if we were to do some kind of shared print, I mean, we might need to integrate with other services that are more like um, uh, you know, inventory management for like a shared repository or something like that. So that's definitely down the road, but it's a use case that we've seen coming up quite a bit. And then finally, I did want to just talk a little bit more about um, how to get involved in reshare if it's something that seems exciting to you. Um, I think the, the first and the easiest thing that people can do is just to be an advocate for this project. Um, if you like what you see here, if this sounds exciting to you, if you could see your consortium being involved in this, you know, mention it to the people you know who work at your consortium, um, sh you know, just kind of spread the word and say like, this is something my library would really like to see and what can, what can we do as a consortium to judge if we want to get involved. Um, for people who are sort of past that point, if you really do are like ready to commit, uh, we have a website with a bunch of information about how to get involved in ReShare. Um, some of the primary things we're looking for, and uh, Jill kind of showed this on her grid earlier, um, we would love to have libraries or consortia um, contributing developers or domain experts, so people who would be willing to work on the project. 
Um, of course, funding never hurts. So, you know, that's another way to contribute. And then as we get through MVP, we're going to be looking for pilot sites as well. So there's a lot of different ways that people can get involved. And so if you're um, a consortium or work for a consortium and you want to know more about this, um, as Jill said, you know, we would be happy to talk more with anybody who wants to learn more deeply about the project or what it means to be involved with ReShare. Um, and so this email address here, um, the info at projectreshare.org, is a great way to just kind of send an inquiry and get in touch. Um, of course, people can get in touch with me or Jill or Kurt directly as well, and we'll get you to the right place. Um, so I think we have left a good amount of time for questions. So at this point, I'm going to kind of turn it over to the group and see if we have any questions to answer. We do indeed. Thomas, go ahead, Kurt, please. Um, got a couple of questions. Yeah, I mean, we, we've got eight questions here so far. I'm going to grab some of these because I can answer them quickly uh, to the ILL folks that are asking about stuff. So Kate is asking, do you plan for ReShare to ever handle article sharing? The answer to that is absolutely. Uh, we, we fully recognize that that's the other half of this. You know, you've got a returnable, you have a non-returnable. Um, and then she further asked, do you mean that ReShare would import unfilled requests to Iliad where staff would process or that unfilled request would be sent out through OCLC? Absolutely. Part of what we want here is a system that's capable of talking to other systems. So if we had article sharing in ReShare and it didn't, it failed for whatever reason, that could go out to Docline, that could go to OCLC, that could go to the British Library, that could go to any variety of other places. The goal here is to get away from having these sort of walled gardens of systems that we've had previously. And then I'm going to grab two other very ILL specific. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Because I just got a message from. Um, <clears throat> okay, now I understand what Mike is asking. Sorry. And then Margaret's asking Kristen mentioned something about what state a request would be in relative to the actions that can be taken with it. Um, my understanding is the new ISO ILL standard is not covered by state tables the same way the old standard was. Can somebody elaborate on this? Um, state was probably not the best word to use there, Margaret. So no, we're not thinking about that. It's more a status that a request is, has has reached. Yeah, you know, the equivalent of it being checked out to um, the patron. So, um, and then the last one is from Allison. Has platform accessibility, both for the staff side and patron side, been considered during this process? I would love to hear more about that at some point. Uh, the answer to that is yes, but at this point, we just have mock-ups. We haven't actually done any sort of, you know, code for that. But I can add a little bit about accessibility. Um, in that we have um, a member of our development team, um, Jill Oskuthorpe from Knowledge Integration, who has worked on Folio as well. And Folio has actually done a, um, some accessibility testing recently. So we have taken a look at the outcomes of that and done um, a little summary. And Jill is going to be thinking about how we can build accessibility testing into our QA processes. So that's still in the works, but we are very aware of the importance of that. And we're trying to do it from the start rather than do a bunch of work and then have to go back and fix it. Okay, I'm going to grab two other questions with this. Kate again is asking if we are, intend to have a document delivery component. Absolutely. Uh, it's pretty much impossible to not do document delivery as part of this because if we're going to do articles, why would I differentiate between that that the patron is having trouble discovering locally versus something that we simply don't own or is available electronically through an open source resource or so on and so forth. So we're really looking at this very broadly, but again, that minimally viable product is concentrating on returnables. And to Abby's question of do we envision reshare facilitating the lending of eBooks? We would love to be able to do that. Yes, that's definitely something that we have in mind with this.
If there are other questions, Peter, maybe you could facilitate since I'm sharing my screen, I can't really pull up the chat and stuff. Sure. Uh, there is a, a question. Can you talk about the business model a bit? Uh, I know the apps are open source, but how do you envision a consortium that has little technical expertise would implement reshare? Are the primary costs a combination of one-time professional services to implement and some ongoing support costs? I can speak to that. Um, this is Jill, can you hear me okay, Peter? Yes, yep. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, this is something we've talked a, a lot about. Uh, my consortium in particular has absolutely no capacity to host and run a service like this on our own. Um, and I think there's a common misconception with, with open source software that you, know, you have to do it all yourself. Um, and that's absolutely not the case here. Um, what we're building in uh, from the very beginning is um, a, uh, an opportunity for consortia or libraries to work with a service provider or, you know, of your choice or the option to host it yourself if you do, in fact, have the capacity and desire to do that um, in order to, uh, you know, implement the service and then um, and then you know host and uh, manage it going forward um, what we're thinking about here is it's not actually all that different than any other you know piece of software that you would acquire from a commercial provider if, if that is in fact the, 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 the way that you want to go about um, doing business here um, so um, I mentioned earlier sort of the, the business model around provisional service arrangements. And, and this is exactly what we're talking about, where um, we're looking at index data as a potential service provider. And when I say we, I mean the steering committee um, is looking at index data. Once this, this code is, is at a place where it's production ready, um, we're very much looking to our commercial providers to be able to supply services where, yes, there's going to be an implementation period and, and phase that needs to happen in order to make sure that it's up and running for your group or, or for your set of libraries. Um, but then there are the ongoing services that, that you need to support technically, uh, the, the set of the, the platform and the set of tools that, that we're going to be making available. Um, so we do envision that there will be ongoing costs associated with that in the same way that you would purchase a, a piece of software or license use of a software from any other, from any other provider that you can think of. Um, so we're envisioning that there will be annual costs. Um, one thing that we've been very clear about from the very beginning is that this needs to be affordable. Um, and we need to, to set this up in a way that, um, that is not going to um, cost more than, than our existing sets of services. Um, and, and so uh, that is something that the, the steering committee has been very much aware of uh, over time, looking at the costs, uh, sort of the, the expenditures that we as libraries make in, on um, these sets of services that we provide for resource sharing purposes. And how do we, how do we put this together in a way that's uh, packaged to be affordable specifically for groups of libraries? Um, and so that's very much been a, a part of the conversation. Um, so in terms of exact costs, I mean, I couldn't give you an exact number today, but I can tell you that it wouldn't be all that different than what any of us are paying uh, today for, for our resource sharing services. And, and, the, and the goal here really is to take advantage of the fact that this software is open source. So really there, there's opportunity to introduce competition. Um, and uh, where, where libraries are able to uh, select a service provider based on, on the quality of the services that they can provide. Um, and on the other side, um, service providers are able to take a piece of software that's been built and then innovate on it and try to make it as good as possible. And then that is available to the community. So I, I think um, in terms of, of the ways that you would go about purchasing these types of services, you know, I think I think we almost have to um, change our, our thinking, or at least the the that that notion that that open source software means you have to do it all yourself. Um, absolutely not. That is definitely not what we're considering here at Palsy. I, I know I could never do that uh, with my with my set of resources that I have available to me. Um, so I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but uh, hopefully that that helps. 
Great. Uh, another question. Uh, will reshare serve as a kind of management system for multiple systems or consortia? I, one ring to rule them all or kind of a skin over multiple services? Uh, or will it function as a service slash consortium front end on its own that can connect to multiple other services or systems? So I can take that one. Um, I think the, the sort of second option is probably a little bit more of what we're planning for MVP. So the scope being returnables and consortial resource, resource sharing specifically with hopefully some of this ability to pass requests out to other resource sharing services as needed if they can't be filled from within the consortium. Um, but then the, the first option, the idea of the one ring, uh, that is actually more part of our long-term vision uh, where it would be, we would love to see that, that reshare could be a way like your sort of one-stop shop for resource sharing um, and has integrations into these other tools, but is the, the way that you actually kind of have a hub of operations and control the other services. So that'll be something we'll be building towards as a more of a long-term goal. Yeah, if I could add on to that, Kristen, if you're done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, in many ways, what we're looking at with reshare is the recognition that the vast majority of what we borrow is going to come from consortia with which we have relationships. So the notion would be we'd start out in a consortia, try to you know get that returnable through there, but then be able to jump to another consortia. So, you know, if I was, you know, if I was in Michigan, like Ralph is, then, you know, I could then, you know, go from the Big Ten and jump to, you know, the Michigan Melcat Consortia. Or here in Illinois, I would go from the Big Ten at Northwestern and I would jump to the Carly Consortia. Or, you know, if it failed in those two that I'm a member of, then, you know, I could go to another consortia, say the Ivies Plus, uh, that we would have some sort, of, some sort of relationship with. So it's a very different way of thinking about this than the way the current systems are set up. We want to not just, you know, have that consortial system that there's a wall around it and there's, you know, a front end that's built for the software that does just that consortia. It's the ability to move between them and do things that way. Looking at this from the standpoint of libraries that we have partnerships with or libraries where we don't particularly have a formal relationship with them, but they're definitely places that we borrow from frequently. Okay, uh, this next question comes from someone who should try to find themselves on the subject matter experts group. Uh, the questions are, would the uh, item be easily identified when, uh, when it arrives if this is unmediated? And what about uh, the patron whose email has changed? Would we get a notice that the send failed? I can take this. Yeah, I mean, all of these are the sorts of things that the subject matter experts, the people that are down in the weeds day to day processing these requests and running into problems like these would be being would be be handling. I mean, this these are the sorts of, you know, it's it's great when everything works properly, but then we all know that that problem is the thing that's going to take longer to work with. So we want to build in an appropriate level of, you know, what to do when things don't work properly into the system. And if, yeah, that wasn't, if my comments wasn't leading enough, uh, these are, this, as Kurt said, the subject matter experts in this kind of uh, uh, user experience first design uh, are right there uh, uh, doing the designing uh, before the, the software is even started to be coded. Um, yeah, oh, and I can add yep. to that too, sure. just about the question of if, you know, recognizing things when they come, like that's what one of the things we really want to make things like that easy. And that's where like that unbox app comes in that, you know, you open this box. I mean, I guess maybe there's something on the box that indicates it's from another library, but that 
there could be some kind of manifest in there that's automatically generated. And then all you have to do is scan those barcodes into reshare and basically say, I received this and now it's going to be routed to, um, you know, checked in to reshare so it can be placed on hold for the patron, put on a shelf for them to come and get it. So we want to kind of make those transitions easy and that's something that our subject matter experts are helping us figure out. Uh, this is a, a question um, about the, how this, this uh, system is placed in, in a library, it's place in the library. Uh, is this intended to be the first option for interlibrary loan or a replacement? Uh, or is it intended more for consortial lending? I'm wondering why a library would continue to pay for Iliad or any other ILL service. I can take this one if you want me to, Kristen and Jill, uh, being the one person that works in the library <laughs> that's on the panel. Um, I mean, it's kind of a question of yes to all of them and no to all of them because it really depends on what the library situation is. I mean, we 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 don't want to be monolithic with things. I mean, this could be the first option that a place would go to that they would choose to do that or, you know, depending on what their their level of, you know, service that they're able to provide, you know, this this could be what they use. If if it's a place that does consortial lending and that's the only option that you give to a particular population, say undergraduates, then yes, that's a possibility for this. I mean, it's it's really a what we want is an additional system that's out there that gives us more flexibility based upon how all of our different libraries work. I mean, a library very well could continue to pay for Iliad. They could continue to have a subscription to WorldCat ILL. Uh, they could continue to be members of Rapid. There's a, I mean, what we're trying with this system to do is to look at what the different things that libraries need are and then build software that works based upon that. And if that means connections into multiple other systems, then yeah, we're going to put those things in. You know, it could be a medical library that chooses to go to DocLine first, and then if it fails in DocLine, they would go to their rapid partners or vice versa. So we're not trying to, you know, replace anything. We're trying to give the ability for there to be flexibility for you and your library to be able to do things the way your institution needs them to be done. Perfect. Uh, Jill or Kristen? No, I, I guess I would just echo what Kurt said. I mean, the goal here is to provide that flexibility that, that folks need. Um, you know, there may be cases where, where you would think about replacement of, of existing technologies, but that's not the goal. The goal is actually um, the modularity and allowing for choice. And, and I think that that's really the strength of this, this project is, is not to make any assumptions about, um, you know, what's good for a library, but actually to allow you um, to make those decisions uh, at, for, your, for your local uh, community. And, um, and, and so I think we hope that there's going to be ultimate, you know, flexibility built into the system. Um, and I think you can see from some of the, the prototyping and sort of the, 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 um, the feedback and input that we've had from our subject matter experts so far, we're hoping that this is just the natural choice because it's just going to be the best system that's out there. But, um, but I also think that um, there are a lot of other things that go into those decisions. And, and so we're, we're hyper aware of that. Um, I, I know um, in, in my own case, within my own consortium, um, we are looking for that flexibility to allow all of my libraries to participate in resource sharing um, with the, 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 the fewest amount of barriers as possible. So mm. I would just add that to what Kurt said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the only other thing I'd add, um, I think a reason why people might choose to use ReShare is that 
the the community will persist even once MVP is done. And so it's a product that people can have a direct influence on its development path and, and you know, the way that it evolves. And so if that's something that's appealing to a particular library or consortium, I think it, it offers an opportunity to be part of that community in a way that other software might not. So I think that could be a big appeal for some people. Great. Uh, I'm going to pull a uh, question out of the chat that was uh, sent directly to the panelists. Uh, is there a patron interface and would it be customizable? I think there would have to be one and it would absolutely have to be customizable again. I mean, much of what we're trying to do here is provide flexibility for libraries to be able to do what they need to be able to do. Um, you know, at Northwestern and in many of our Big Ten reports, our goal was to have a single dashboard for the patrons. So, you know, we'd want to be able to use an API or something else like that to pull that into our Primo instance here. But that's not what every single library is going to want to be able to do or that you know, would work. So really flexibility is, is the key to this, but that's flexibility designed around what libraries tell us they need to have. And just in terms of some more specifics of what we're actually thinking. Um, so I mentioned the idea that people could pull in and Kurt's mentioning this to pull it into their existing discovery layer, but we're also looking at using probably either viewfind or blacklight to create like a dedicated patron interface that would let the patron search the consortia as a single catalog and then place their request. So that would be available for anyone who wanted to go that route. And then within the lo local interface, if people choose to do that integration, what we're hoping to do is provide at least APIs, but maybe some other tools that let people do things like embed a button or something in the record that says, you know, request this item. And then when you click that, they might go through a screen or two to sort of confirm and process the request and get a confirmation. Um, the third option that we know that we probably will need is just kind of like a blank request form and that would be for like known items or for someone who didn't go through the discovery layer for some point for some reason. I think the goal is that most people do want this to be very integrated into the discovery experience, but we know that that's not always the case and so there'll need to be some kind of you know, just a way to say put this into reshare. So those are kind of the main things that we're looking at right now. Great. Uh, I have one final question, at least at this point, and, and one that, uh, Jill, you had, had typed an answer to uh, in the Q&A box, but I think it's important to, uh, to call it out for posterity reasons uh, onto the recording. Uh, and that was, uh, were any public libraries approached for the development of this project? Yes, and, and, and the response that I typed um, and uh, that I'd like to make sure everybody's aware of. Um, so uh, this, this initiative, as I mentioned uh, in, in my opening session, was uh, a really grassroots initiative of conversations that had been happening among consortia, which happened to be academic library focused. However, um, there's very much a desire to have this also be public library uh, supportive um, and one of the things that uh, we've been doing is actually actively recruiting libraries that are um, supporting multiple types of libraries uh, so consortia that um, have public and, and academic libraries uh, we, we really hope to, to engage with and, and we have a couple of conversations that are ongoing with various groups um, that in, that include public libraries. Um, the other thing I would just mention is that if you are here listening today and you're a part of a group that does um, uh, support public libraries and resource sharing, uh, we'd very much like to hear from you and, and talk with you about this because um, there is sort of this desire to um, ensure that reshare will work across systems. I know in my own state in particular, we've got one system for academic libraries, one system for public libraries. We would love to um, be able to work together more closely and to ensure that we can meet the needs of both groups. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, yes, we are, we are actively recruiting uh, for steering committee and governance type 
uh, activities, folks that, that support public libraries, but we would love to hear from you if there's anybody else out there that's, that's interested in getting uh, more, more involved in this project. Wonderful. I do not see any other questions and we are approaching the bottom of the hour. Uh, so this concludes today's forum on Project ReShare. Uh, the recording of this forum will be posted to the Open Library Foundation YouTube channel shortly. Uh, I want to thank our speakers, uh, Jill, uh, the no longer acting Kurt, uh, and Kristen, uh, and to everyone who asked questions and added comments to our conversation. Uh, thank you very much and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. everyone.